can get started. Um, right. Okay. Okay, so I want to uh, back up a bit from last time. I want to mention some original sources for the material in this section. So there is this paper of Bojanitran from 81, and then the paper of Rosenlicht from 83, and then um, <clears throat> later papers by uh, McIntyre Marker and myself, and then a later, oh, still later paper by myself um, <clears throat> uh, from 2000. And, but actually what we are going to do is I think a little bit better than what is done at least about the first order um, differential equations than what you can find in those, uh, those places. It's a bit more general and a bit more, um, well, with weaker assumptions. <clears throat> so um, I started the same year to talk about the same year's break um, uh, explicit case but I want to, again, here back up a little. Uh, Mikhail's questions last time prompted me to review a uniqueness fact about solutions of first order ODEs, which is going to be used in the proof. <clears throat> and this is the following. Um, if you have an open set in R2 and a continuous uh, function, capital F on U, well, let's say that the solution of the differential equation capital Y prime is e, uh, capital F, capital X, capital Y, <clears throat> um, is simply a function little y, which is uh, in C1 of I, where I is an open interval, um, such that, first of all, the graph of this function, um, you can apply, yeah, um, um, lies in U and, um, for every t in the interval i, y prime t is capital F t, y t, for all t and y. So that's what we mean by a solution, the obvious notion of a solution, right? But now the important thing for us is that such a solution, um, if you fix, if you give yourself an initial condition is uniquely determined um, in the following sense. <clears throat> if Oh, and this requires that capital F is not just um, continuous on U, but C1 on U. So if capital F is a C1 function on U, uh, and little y and little z are both solutions on maybe different intervals, it doesn't matter, um, <clears throat> where they, but they, same, they have the same value at a certain point A in the intersection where they are both defined, then they must agree on the whole common interval where they are defined. Right, so this is the uniqueness of solutions with given initial condition. The initial condition here is that y a is takes a certain value, and so then any other solution that takes that same value must agree on on the uh, common domain. <clears throat> and it is really important here that capital F is required is uh, is a C one function. Um, in the definition of a solution, we didn't require capital F to be C1, but only continuous. But if you, re but replacing F in C1 by F just continuous, the uniqueness fails. That could be, um, uh, and so, <clears throat> right. So now I, now we can um, um, start with where, where we almost ended up with last time. So till further notice, H will be a Hardy field. <clears throat> And when I say germ, I mean a germ at plus infinity. And then I stated already the following proposition. Um, you have an open and semi-algebraic set in Rn plus one and a semi-algebraic C1 function uh, on U. <clears throat> um, and you have N germs in capital H and also a C1 germ um, such that, well, um, you have that eta basically satisfies the, uh, the, uh, this ordinary differential equation, <clears throat> eta prime t equals capital V, h t, eta t. Um, 
where HT is an abbreviation for H1T up to HNT. Now, of course, since we are talking about germs, we say eventually this has to, to be true. Uh, and of course, the first part, HT, A to T, and U, is just to guarantee that, that you can plug it in into, into capital Phi, that it makes sense. <clears throat> okay, under these conditions that you have this solution to this differential equation, um, eta must also lie in a Hardy field, ex must lie in a Hardy field extension of capital H. Yeah, so, the, so the data are partly semi-algebraic, namely capital Phi, and partly from capital H, namely the H1 up to Hn. Oh, what, what happened? Uh, how does one get this away? How does one remove this uh, little screen here? Click click on the bottom right thing. You see a small keyboard on the bottom right of your screen? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right, right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, oh, but wait, this I just, what is this? Why, why does it, why does this word I just show, show up here? Okay. Oh, on the, on the top, click on draw. On the top, click on draw. On the top? Do I want to insert draw on the on the on the purple part? Look at the purple part. Yes. Click on draw. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ig ignore the I just thing. I would I would just say ignore it for now. Ah. Yeah, this is <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of it, but anyway, I hope it doesn't disturb people as much as it does disturb me. Um <clears throat> Okay, so we already started the proof. <clears throat> um, passing to an extension, yeah, we can always make H bigger <clears throat> and we can make it so that it contains all the real numbers and it's real closed. And um, <clears throat> then I already stated claim one, namely that this function, a, this germ eta will be eventually negative or eventually zero or eventually positive <clears throat> and to prove this claim uh, we may as well assume that um, well that we are not in the first case or in the third case and that uh, or that we are in, in in neither case and that would mean that you would have eta t is zero for arbitrarily large t's right um, but then you and then or that you not are in the first case or the last case, and that means that um, you have eta t for arbitrary eta t equals zero for arbitrary large t, and then it's enough to show that then eta t is zero eventually. Um, okay, and then you just take some real number a and the representatives of those germs, which we denote by the same letters h1 up to hn and eta, which we now take to be c1 functions. Right, um, since the eta, since eta is known, is given as a C1 germ, that's certainly possible for eta, and H1 up to Hn are in a Hardy field, so that you can also take them to be C1 on, on a certain interval from A to plus infinity. And we can do that in such a way that this double star equation holds not just eventually, but for all T bigger than A. And then we were, um, right. And then we already did some something last time, namely we showed that from this assumption that namely that eta t is zero for arbitrary large t, uh, we have not just that h t zero in u for arbitrary large t, but even h t zero in u eventually. Um, right, that uses this uh, fact about uh, eventual behavior of uh, functions in a Hausdorff field with respect to a semi-algebraic uh, um, set. <clears throat> and so we can, may as well increase A a little bit and uh, restricting the H's and eta accordingly so that this will be true, not just eventually, but for all T bigger than A. That's just a matter of uh, to simplify formulations a little bit. <clears throat> And then, now the main thing in is really this subclaim that since we have eta t 
is zero for arbitrarily large t, that will mean that means that there are many pairs t1 less than t2 bigger than a, where eta t1 is eta t2 will be equals zero. And then I claim that then there will, will there must be a t in the interval between t1 and t2, including the endpoints now, where phi h t0 is zero. Um, okay, so this is where the heart of the argument takes place. Um, okay, so the subclaim certainly holds if eta um, prime t1 is, yeah, subclaim holds trivially. Um, for T is T1, if eta prime T1 is zero, since eta prime, eta prime T equals phi T, um, uh, sorry, phi H T comma eta T, so if uh, eta prime t1 happens to be zero, uh, then you get, uh, uh, these, these, but, but if you plug in t1, you will see that um, that phi h t1 zero is, is zero. <clears throat> Since we are assuming eta t1 is zero, right? So assume that eta prime t1 is not zero, so, so assume Eta prime T1, uh, not zero, say eta prime T1 positive. Um, <clears throat> right, and the case eta prime T1 negative is, is similar, yeah? Case eta prime T1 less than zero is similar. So I'm, I'll leave that. Okay, so now if eta prime t1 is positive and eta t1 is zero, that means that eta will be also positive for just to the right of t1, yeah? Then um, eta t is greater than zero. And, <clears throat> but since eta prime t is phi h t eta t, this is also true for capital phi h t comma zero is also positive for all t bigger than t one sufficiently close close to t one right uh, eta prime t one bigger than zero so you have a positive slope there. And so, and since eta t1 is zero, it must, that means that eta t is positive there. And phi h t1, um, let me see now, where, why is phi h t0 greater than zero? Uh, ah, yeah, eta, if you plug in t1 here, you get eta prime t1 equals phi of h t1 eta mm. um, t1 which means, um, yeah, this is simply eta prime. Yeah. Ah, well, this is simply, this is simply eta prime T, right? And since eta prime T1 is not zero and pos actually positive, then eta prime T is also positive for the all T greater than T1 sufficiently close to T1. So, right. <clears throat> Um, now we, we, uh, now Lau, we go... sorry. Yes. Um, um, you said it equals to eta prime T, but it's only for points where eta T equals to zero. Uh, so maybe just eta uh, phi of H of T is the uh, one uh, dot zero is positive and phi of H of T dot yeah, zero okay. is uh, continuous. As long as you, as long as you, as long as you, 
uh, accept that phi h t comma zero is bigger than zero for all t bigger than t one sufficiently close to t one. Uh, you're right. The argument that I I, I gave there is a notational um, um, co uh, conflict there. Um, this is be okay. So eta eta prime t is phi h t eta t, right? For T1, this gives you eta prime T1 is phi H T1 zero. Eta prime T1 is positive, so phi H T1 zero is greater than zero. But then, of course, this remains true for all T greater than T1 sufficiently close to T1. So now I actually said it correctly. I don't know if that helps, but anyway, this is a trivial argument that, that I don't want to uh, waste time on. <clears throat> The thing is that now I want to decrease T2. Yeah, so we are now going to the other end of the interval, decreasing T2 uh, sufficient um, if necessary. We rearrange uh, that eta T is greater than zero. <clears throat> Uh, on the whole interval for all t in t1, t2, open interval, and t and eta t2 is zero. Uh, oh yeah, well that's already given, right? You you just go to the next. You go, you go from t1 to the next zero of the function eta, right? Uh, it might be a smaller t2 than given here, but um, if you do that. <clears throat> Then of course the uh, eta will be positive on this entire interval. If I draw a picture, then of course it will be t1, t2, uh, eta. This is eta, and so um, and this and so it is clear that eta uh, so. Eta prime T two is uh, phi T two, uh, which is actually eta T two, which is zero, is less than or equal to zero. Um, right. Ah, it gets worse and worse. Let me just. Right. Ah, okay. So now if you look at the function phi, phi of h phi of um, uh, h t1 zero. Wait a minute, where am I? Yeah, phi of h t1 comma zero is positive, but and phi of of course I have I made a uh, another uh, typo. This should be h t2. Ah. Right. Okay, so since phi of h t one comma zero is greater than zero and phi of h t two zero is less than equal to zero by the intermediate value um, fact, uh, there is a therefore there exists a t t one t two such that phi to uh, it's oh well it's just horrible to work on this desk or which is not a desk but uh eta t is zero okay so that proves the subclaim <clears throat> now um now the subclaim, if you look at it again, um, whenever you have two points where eta vanishes, then there must be a point in between where phi vanishes in this way, right? But since I'm assuming that there are arbitrary large t's where eta vanishes, that means there are arbitrary large t where phi h t comma zero is zero. Yeah? So the subclaim okay, is 
arbitrary lots. Uh, greater than a with phi h t zero is zero, but since this is all, since now we are dealing with um, uh, uh, a function a germ in h, this means so phi um, h t zero is zero eventually and yeah, not just for arbitrary large but for all sufficiently large t mm. right this uses this proposition 181 at the end of the first uh, section the behavior the eventual behavior of um, elements in of germs in h with respect to semi-algebraic sets and functions right um Okay, but now we observe that the ODE, um, then, but then the ODE, ordinary differential equation, um, why, let's write it this way, Y prime T equals capital C, HT, comma, YT has, has um, has two solutions has the solution has the solution the germ solution yeah so it's only uh, the germ solution eta and the germ solution zero right uh, zero because um, because we know that phi h t comma zero is zero eventually. And so that means that if you take y to be z, the, the, the germ zero, that this is eventually the case. <clears throat> so we have now two solutions um, defined for all sufficiently large t. And one is zero and the other is eta. But eta is zero for arbitrary large t. That means that by the uniqueness property, these two must be agree, yeah. So, so by uniqueness, uniqueness of solutions with given initial conditions of solutions, we get eta equals zero, and that is uh, as a germ, right? So that proves the this proof claim. Claim one. Okay. So um, yeah, if I hope this is not too uh, confusing. <clears throat> but now uh, claim two is simply uh, an easy generalization of this. Now, namely, um, yeah. So for claim one, we had that if ultimately eta is less than zero or zero or or greater than zero and now of course we, we simply have to do to do this not just for eta but for eta minus any element in h given any uh, f in h uh, either eta um, eta t less than h t eventually uh, f t f t eventually or eta t equals h t uh, again f t eventually or eta t bigger than f t eventually um, okay so this is an easy consequence namely to see this uh, just apply claim one to another differential equation, uh, claim one to, um, to, 
to zeta equals the difference between eta and f, yeah, uh, and the ODE and the corresponding ODE that it, which it satisfies, um, which is z prime t equals um, capital V ht uh, ft plus zt minus f prime t um, satisfied by zeta. Zeta. Um, right, so I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that um, eta minus f satisfies this differential equation. <clears throat> and of course, the, uh, what you have to do now is to, to augment the, the h1 of two hn by two extra functions, namely f and uh, f prime um, with h1. Yeah, so the phi of course changes and I'm not going to, um, um, in order to apply claim one, you have to, Define the right capital phi, um, but the H's you uh, the H's that you have to work with are the previous H's, but now it also uh, augmented by F and F prime with H one to H n augmented to H um, n plus one is F and h n plus two equals f prime. And these are still germs in h, right? f was given in. And so, um, and then the new function, the new capital phi that you end up with is still the semi-algebraic function. Of course, with a different domain, which is now an open sub semi-algebraic open subset in r to the power um, n plus three instead of n plus one. <clears throat> But this is all routine, so I, and st it will still be a C one function. Um, so, and now claim three. Um, yeah, maybe before I state that, uh, let me say a, a consequence of claim two. Yeah, um, so claim two already gives a, already gives a Hardy, a Hausdorff field. Since it shows that eta is, um, minus, yeah, already gives a Hausdorff field. capital H eta. Um, con and it's also in C1, right? Since eta is in C1 and capital H is the Hardy field, this is um, a subfield of, of the ring of C1 germs and it's real closure. And of course, then you also have its real closure. which is also still in C1. H eta right I, I mentioned at some point that if you have a um, Hausdorff field contained in CR then the real closure is also in CR which um, anyway now I can state claim three so H eta will in general not be a Hardy field, but H eta, the real closure will be H, R, H eta is a Hardy field. Um, yeah, and this is, the, yeah, and this uh, uh, establishing the proposition. Yeah, it actually establishes the proposition in a rather um, precise way. It says exactly which Hardy field um, eta lies in, establishing the proposition. Um, 
Okay. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do that? Um, well, first I'm going to take the derivative of eta um, first. Well, I already have the derivative given, right? Eta prime t equals phi h t comma eta t eventually. Um, and phi same as a break. Sorry, Lau. Uh, yes. Can I, can I interrupt you a moment? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a bit lost. Can you remind me briefly what are the general assumptions, the setting of this? Uh, um, so back in the statement of the proposition. Yeah, yeah. right. So, uh, oh, the proposition. Yeah, you have an, <laughs> an open semi-algebraic region in Rn plus one and a, a semi-algebraic C1 function on it. And then you have um, germs the H1 up to Hn in capital H. Yeah, yes. Maybe H is a Hardy field, right? Yes. And you have a C1 germ, eta, which satisfies this differential equation here, first order differential equation. Then this okay. eta must lie in a Hardy field extension. Okay. And uh, we already made uh, extended H to contain all the reals and real closed. And now I, I want to show that, um, yeah, so so I have now constructed a Hardy field, if the claim true, three is true, which does contain eta. Right. Yes. So far it's only a Hausdorff field, right? We uh, the claim two just gives you a Hausdorff field, H eta, and then the real closure also, which is okay. So now we have to show that the derivative of anything in this real closure is also in, in this real closure. So first of all, we look at the derivative of eta itself, eta prime t equals uh, okay. phi of uh, eta t and phi same as the break. And then we, um, um, what was it? Um, we had this proposition 181 about the eventual behavior of germs in a Hausdorff field with respect to semi algebraic sets and functions. And that particular, this means in particular that this, this here is, um, is in, in the real closure of, of yeah, yeah, this. So by proposition 181. <laughs> about this eventual behavior with respect to semi algebraic sets and functions. This means that eta prime must lie indeed in the algebraic in this real closure. Um, right. So here we are just using that we are dealing with a Hausdorff field. <coughs> and eta prime is equal to this semi algebraic function apply to things that are in this Hausdorff field. <clears throat> okay. Uh, therefore, now, now it's an, uh, once you have that, if you take any rational function in eta and you take the derivative, <coughs> well, then some, a, then it will again be a rational function not in eta perhaps but in eta and eta prime but since eta prime lies in here that means that this is in in h eta so this is just a, a, a little exercise a little computation with purely differential algebraic that since eta prime is in here all the derivatives of the rational functions in eta are are in here and of course, the fact that H is a Hardy field. <clears throat> okay, now, now um, we're still not there. We have to show that the derivative of anything in, in the real closure is in the still in the real closure. So let G be in H eta real closure um, <clears throat> to get to get 
G prime also in the real closure. Um, take the minimum polynomial of E8 of G, take the minimum polynomial PY um, of G over H eta, yeah, since G is algebraic over H eta, you have this minimum polynomial. And um, then by an earlier identity, earlier equality, we have that G prime can be, is uh, minus P delta G partial P with respect to Y, G. Right. And, and P delta was this polynomial that you get by taking the derivative of each of the coefficients. And these coefficients lie in H eta. And so the derivatives of these coefficients are in the real closure. That is what we, uh, what we showed here. <clears throat> and therefore, P delta G is in H eta real closure. Um, and of course, the, the, the denominator is automatically in, this is again a polynomial over um, H eta. And so this is also in H eta real closure. So, so G prime is in, in the real closure. Okay, and we are done. We have shown that, uh, that this is a Hardy field, that the derivatives of all the elements in this, in this Hausdorff field lie also in it. And so it's, okay. Well, this is a little bit uh, lengthy story, so I, but I still have uh, some time. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so one thing, and we already applied this last time to show that uh, if you have a bounded element in a Hausdorff field, sorry, a bounded element in a Hardy field, that then the sine and the cosine of it lie in a Hardy field extension, <clears throat> right? Um, because they satisfy certain and differential equation of the right form. <clears throat> but now you can ask why only Samuel's break fee? What's so, what's so special about it? Well, I mean, <laughs> in a way, um, <clears throat> we would like to really uh, also use things like X pen lock, yeah? Good. Would like to use, like to, uh, to, um, to um, allow uh, x and log, x log, etc. Be uh, involved in phi. Uh, so, in fact. The right generalization is L minimal, right? Um, in fact, we, um, uh, we can allow O minimal V. Um, right, and actually just yesterday I found I think the best, the, the, a better approach to this generalization than you can find in, um, in these papers that I mentioned. I mean, um, Bojanitsan gives a very complicated formulation like um, if you have a, some expression build up from X block and, and algebraic functions and uh, well, it, the, the precise description goes on for uh, almost a page. <clears throat> And um, then in, um, 
the paper with McIntyre and Marker that I mentioned, and later on, I um, or we um, we generalized this to an O minimal setting. But I yesterday I found out that it's still not optimal, and I found a better way to do it. Um, so this is in some sense uh, new, and um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about next and on Thursday. <clears throat> so I want to talk now about a, an O minimal uh, version of all the above, 3.2, O minimal, yeah. It takes some care to, 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 to formulate all this precisely, an O minimal version, not just of the, the thing about differential equations, but actually also about most of the material that are already treated for, for Hausdorff fields uh, and Hardy fields. <clears throat> um, an O minimal version of, of much of what we did, we uh, did. And I think the, the, the this generalization is actually um, worth worth doing, um, and will be used later on when we talk about second order differential equations, where the story is a lot more complicated. <clears throat> okay, so let me start then. I, I will not get very far on this today, but I'll just introduce the 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 setting. So L will be a first order language. Yeah, so this is in some sense model theoretic in nature, what I'm going to, or at least I def you need to use some concepts from, from logic and, and model theory. Um, and it, which extends, extending the language of ordered rings, extending, the language. Yeah, it's if you want to really be precise, you would probably have to say first order one sorted, right? First order one sorted language. It's, I, we don't have to consider many sorted structures here. Extending the language of um, the language of ordered rings. Well, let me. Uh, what is the language? Ah. Uh, The language less than zero one minus plus times of all the things. Yeah, with possibly new function symbols, but no new relation symbols. With um, <clears throat> Possibly, yeah. It could be just this language, but uh, I allow function symbols, uh, but no new, yeah. I he, In this language of order things, I have, of course, the binary relation symbol less than, but uh, in this extended language, I, I do not allow any, mo any more relation symbols, but no new, relation symbols yeah and for me constant symbols are simply function symbols of added to zero um, so i don't have to <clears throat> right and i also assume that i am giving an, an l expansion r tilde of r tilde which is um, structure with underlying set the real line, and then uh, with the usual interpretation of the symbols in the language of ordered rings. But then possibly further structure given by the new function symbols. Um, this is an L expansion or an L structure that expands 
the usual um, ordered field of real numbers, yeah, which is, if I just talk about the ordered field of real numbers, I denote this by R L. I think other people denote it by R with a bar on top. Um, <clears throat> okay. And, okay, so um, now the assumptions that I want to make, and they are weaker than what I, than what we did in the in the paper, in the papers that I mentioned where I was an, an author, um, co-author or author, um, uh, is that um, first of all R tilde is all minimal, and secondly T oh I forgot to introduce the theory of R tilde uh, T is theory of R tilde. So all the L sentences that are true in it, so it's a complete L theory. L theory. Every L sentence is, is in it or its negation is in it. <clears throat> um, so the assumptions are that R tilde is a minimal and that T has quantifier ordination. So in these papers that I, uh, I mentioned, these last two papers, we also assume that T has a universal axiomatization, but it's not really necessary at all, uh, as I found out yesterday. And it gives you a more elegant um, uh, setup. <clears throat> of course, in some sense, Having quantifier elimination is a matter of convenience. You just, even if you don't have it, you can just extend the language by new function symbols that are definable in terms of the old language and always arrange that T has quantifier elimination. But there are many natural situations where, where T has already quantifier elimination. So let me just give the obvious examples. Uh, R L itself, yeah, for the language of ordered rings, these assumptions are satisfied. Um, and then R N with this extra binary function symbol for division, right? D of X comma Y is the X divided by Y. If X is an absolute value less than equal to the absolute value of Y and Y is not zero. And otherwise D of X, Y is zero. Right, so by extending, and of course, Rn means that you have the function symbols for the restricted analytic functions, and then R and X log. Right, so yeah, for quantifier elimination, you need to add log, which you define to be by convention to be zero at arguments that are less than equal to zero, <clears throat> or some other convention that you bet if you. Um, anyway, these are natural examples, and there are plenty of other ones that are natural uh, cases where the assumption assumptions is satisfied. Mm. Um, let me see. I think I'm out of time now, but this I think um, we should keep in mind this 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 setting, and then I will define it later on what I mean by an R tilde domain. <clears throat> which is like a, um, the analog of a Hausdorff field, but it's not necessarily a field, it's, it's just an integral domain. It turns out that that is actually a better way to start with them. Um, and then uh, I will also, uh, and it turns out that all these things that we did about Hausdorff fields actually work in this setting, <clears throat> to my surprise. Um, and I only found out yesterday. Um, and then ultimately, er, almost anything that we did so far for Hausdorff fields and Hardy fields will be we will be able to generalize to this setting. But I'll do that on on Thursday. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Raoul. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The recording. Any, yeah. Of course, if there are any questions, I then. Uh,